I mean, I'll just throw a name out there. Is I was watching like old French Montana interviews where you know, he had a situation back in the day where he was leaving a recording studio. Yeah, some I guys interview, interviewed him about right, that. Some guys tried to run down on him. Basically, his homie killed the guy with his own gun. French yeah. French says this in the interviews that he wasn't the one who killed the guy. Fr- French got got shot in the head. Right, got grazed in the head, and then that person ended up being dead. Right, that ended up being. But it was like a robbery gone bad. Like right. they were trying to rob French. But I mean, when you watch the old interviews of French, and I'm sure he wouldn't really uh, be so quick to want to like emphasize this at this point. But he basically like in his old interviews, you could see that he wants to leave some space in the conversation so that the people who are watching can believe that he was the one who actually did it. Yeah, in my interview, he, he kind of did that. Right. He just said, he's dead. Yeah, they said that, that dude's dead. Right. Not saying someone else shot him, but not saying that he shot him. Right. But you kind of think that he shot him because there's no other person in the story, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. Uh, but when you're actually familiar with like rapper strategy, you're, you you kind of see what's going on there. It's like ah, oh, he wants to sort of leave that open because he knows that at the end of the day, the idea that he might have killed someone is good, for, mm-hmm. especially that early stage in his career. Later yeah. in your career, it might be a little bit of a liability. Yeah, I mean, you're already a platinum rapper, and you try to downplay that stuff because right. it messes up your endorsements. But I mean, <laughs> Gu- Gucci to this day um, will just bring it up. The baby brings it up on like every song. Does he? He talks on what's the new baby song I was just listening to, but he basically talks about how his daughter, right? Well, how his daughter <clears throat> saw him kill a guy in Walmart, and he just like emphasizes that detail of it. Like, not only did I kill a guy in the Walmart, that was the last album, but my daughter saw it. Like, that's some serious shit. This actually happened, you yeah. know? Yeah, I mean, someone rolls up on you with a gun. You got your family with you, and you're you got a gun with you, right? You know, and you know, like everyone hated me after the. No plug interview. Mm. I'm talking about the killing of Bankroll Fresh, but a year later, Atlanta PD released the footage, and you see Bankroll Fresh with a with like an AK-47 or something, waving it around. And I guess the, the footage cut off right before he shot first. Really? It was it was a return fire kind of situation. <sighs> it was self defense. I mean, this is why No Plug is doing an interview, mm. you know, on the same couch as Twenty One Savage that day. Uh, the whole it's a knife interview that that happened the same day but people like to you know people like to really criticize oh you should have never given him a platform he should have never spoken about it but someone shoots at you first and, and you have a gun what sane person would not return fire hmm. And the whole situation, the story gets warped because it's like Bankroll Fresh was a beloved rapper, and at that time, in the city, yeah. At that time, nobody really even knew who Twenty One yet was yet. This no. was like very, very early, and yeah. certainly nobody knew who, who No Plug was yet. Exactly, exactly. And you know, the most popular person will get the most love, right? So the story kind of shifts based on the popularity. You know, if you know, I'm, I'm trying to. I can't think of a good a good example of this, but yeah, like the popularity of the person will somehow eclipse the actual facts mm. of the case. But the reality is, no plug got in front of my camera, signed a release form, <laughs> and laid out the details of Bankroll Fresh getting killed that night. Why on earth would he do that if it was not self-defense, mm. right? Think about that. And he had already had his case no, dismissed? No statutes. Well, the case was still technically being investigated. It wasn't closed at that point. So explain to me why a person would talk about an open murder, something with no statute of limitations that happened within a couple of months if it was not self-defense. Right. Just think about that for a second. With cameras <laughs> right. in the studio and, and so forth. Because they released footage of this shit. And a bunch of witnesses, an open case, if it was not self-defense, but, but I'm the bad guy for doing the interview. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Whereas if he had, but, and, and that argument against you there falls apart even quicker because it's like, if he didn't do that interview with you, what would he have done? He probably would have hopped on his Instagram live and said the same exact fucking thing. Or, or gone somewhere else. And then it would have been 100% on him and 100%, you know, then everybody else in the media is going to take it and chop it up and that's going to be the news for a couple of days. I don't really see what the, the big problem is with you putting him in front of a camera to tell his truth. Yeah, yeah. 
Listen, I'll, I'll be the bad guy sometimes. I, I'll, I'll take the brunt of it. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for 12 years. It's not going to – the same philosophy that I came into it with, the same philosophy that I have these days, it's not going to change. We're still going to be the, the hard-edged, tough question, you know, get to the truth, heavy research platform. Um, and there's plenty of other places like, you know, like when I interviewed uh, Tim Westwood, he doesn't really do a ton of research. He just likes to go off the cuff. And, and Tim is dope. He's, mm. he's a legend at this. He's been doing it way longer than me. But we have very different styles. Right. You stick two people in front of us, you're going to get vastly different interviews. And th there's, a, there's a fan base for both. Because mm. Tim Westwood might go get the, the big name guests that know that they're getting a safe experience there. Right. I don't get those a lot. <laughs> Anybody who's got something to hide. Um, yeah. No, yeah, totally. But I mean, I think that the thing with No Plug in 21 that really sort of emphasized you know, them being sort of calloused and uh, sort of cold hearted in a way that a lot of people at home don't necessarily understand is that clip that you see where um, 21 is saying on stage to yeah. No Plug. He says, I would have said that I'm the dude who killed bankroll when he's introduced, like yeah, he basically just yeah, introduced yeah, yeah. no plug. And then he's, he specifies to him and like, you know, 21 thinks that nobody can hear him, but actually like that yeah. gives you a glimpse into the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, these are rappers, but they're also just people who are involved in street shit who fucking hate each other. And they don't, you know, there, there are situations like that where it's like clearly 21 doesn't have a, a fucking grain of sympathy the way he says that's no plug, that he just doesn't really... To, to a lot of people, yeah. Bankroll Fresh is this beloved rapper. To him, it's just some guy that they had issues with. Or that maybe 21 had issues with, but at least no plug did. And this is the dichotomy of, of gangster rap, to me, is that everyone wants that real gangster shit. But then when you really see that real gangster shit, everyone's like, oh, how, how, how could he say that? He's been saying it in all his lyrics this whole time. Mm. Do you think that all that's made up? Do you think none of it is based on reality? Do you think that these people have never gotten into a war with somebody and, and shootings have occurred and people have gotten killed and families have been crying and funerals, uh, you know, have been tragic and, and, and hatred and, and hurt and, and everything else like that hasn't gone through? You think this is all made up? So then, like, you, you see all this and, and everyone's dancing to it and grooving to it and everything else like that. And then when you actually hear some of the real stories behind what actually happened, everyone wants to be like fake shocked. Everyone wants to talk about how, how awful and bad this is. But this is, this is why they got popular in the first place. And this has always been my thing of like, well, why do you ask these guys all these criminal questions? But I'm not asking John B these questions because John B's never talked about it in his music. Mm -hmm. John B could be the, the biggest mafia leader <laughs> in North America for all I know, but he's never, but he just does love songs. So why would I talk to him about that when there was no indication that he was into any of that? But when I talked to like a Quando Rondo, like all his lyrics are about gang banging and, and stuff like that. So, so we're going to talk about that in the interview. Like I'm just going to dance around it and have these boring ass interviews. Like you should see sometimes you go to some of these big radio stations and they'll get like a, a Gucci or a little baby and they'll be like 238 views. Oh yeah. Seen I'll, it. You know, I'll yeah. hit my assistant. I'm like, this is 238,000. He's like, Nope, this is 238 dot. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm like, why, why did this person even bother to, to walk into this station? Yeah. Okay. You get a little bit of pub in, in the area from people that are actually listening, but then, it's over, and they put on YouTube, and it goes nowhere at all. Right. It's just like, is, is the interview that bad? Is, is the platform that inept? <laughs> I've seen it before where I've watched people that, like artists that I'm friends with or that I care about or whatever, and I'll see that they went and did an interview with a radio station, and I'll go to watch it. And, you know, some of the people I'm friends with are what I would characterize as, like, bad interviews. Like, they just don't really talk or flesh out their answers that much. And the radio DJ will overcompensate for it by basically, you know, we got DJ Vlad in the building. DJ Vlad, one of the best 
fucking interviews in the game, blah, blah, blah. And they'll do like a 40 second preamble <laughs> before the question. Then they bust the question out. You give your little like 10 second answer. And then they just sort of like rant again for like 30 or 40 <laughs> seconds. And then they get into like another like one word answer. Yeah. And that is like a really bizarre radio guy technique of how to make something out of nothing in an interview. Yeah, I guess radio interviews have to be short also. Because mm -hmm. But then they're doing YouTube and they get the, the 20 minute version or whatever. But you're right, they might be trying yeah. to cut like a one minute chunk for the radio. Yeah, no, I've, I've had so many conversations with program directors about bringing my show to, to various radio stations. And it's, the answer has always been like, yo, we, we, we don't do interviews here. Mm. We, we play music and we'll take a couple minutes out of the interview and, and disperse it between the music, but we're not into these long form conversations. And I'm like, well, I have two hour interviews, so <laughs> yeah, it's just not a good match. And, right. this, and this kind of brings me into why I'm here, you know, we just uh, we just signed a partnership with iHeart. Right. So what led to that? And because uh, you, you stopped doing the podcast the, for, for a while. while yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, we were the company that wasn't that great. We're just gonna leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did it for a little while. And at the end of the day, it, it just ended up going nowhere. There wasn't really any money. The the views weren't really there. So we just completely cut it off for a bunch of years. And uh, a lot of people would always hit us like, "Yo, like I want to listen to your podcast on Spotify or the iHeart." app or or apple music you know apple Podcasts, whatever else you know when i'm going to work but it's like well we're not going to just do it uh if it's, if it's not a real business there so uh when we linked up with high heart uh they really understood the uh the significance of what we do and they really didn't just give us like okay yeah we'll just co-sign you they're like okay we're gonna put a significant amount of money into the marketing of it Mm. We're really going to give you something called the best in class deal. And we have a whole team at iHeart behind this thing. And it seemed like, okay, well, now we have a company that's going to invest in the promotion. And the overall platform of audio streaming is much bigger than it was before. Because mm. Spotify was very small back then. Five years ago, it seemed like so much less it was of SoundCloud a, a real business. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of like SoundCloud and some other crap and this new ad network i've been talking to you just told me they're like well we would kind of like you to stop uploading to soundcloud because those plays don't count as like verified yeah. listens from the uh, from the advertisers, the advertisers or whatever yeah. so if we could just basically move those right. viewers over to apple music or whatever it would be beneficial yeah so it just seemed like a cool situation and uh we were talking to another company that the their marketing budget was like a small percentage of what of what iHeart was going to do. Like iHeart really stepped in, and and I've had talks with Spotify and stuff like that in the past, and there was deals that was supposed to happen that didn't come through. Uh, but when iHeart came in, it was like, okay, this is for the first time we have a company that's going to put a big push behind what it is that we do, as opposed to us just building it up on our own organically, which is what we've always done. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it allows people to start listening to our stuff on, on streaming uh, platforms. And we were actually gonna launch, the, there's this really big interview that we have that we we're, were supposed to launch the podcast with, but the climate of, of the world right now was like, okay, we gotta put this aside, mm. <laughs> push it back, you know, at least a, you know, a couple of months maybe. But so this content is completely different than what you do with live TV with the video no, interviews? No, or? no, it's the, it's the same. It's the audio version of our interviews. Oh, okay. You know, but we are going to have situations where we're going to premiere, you know, the full interview sometimes on the podcast and stuff like that. We're still kind of learning. You know, people were like, you know, my staff was all excited. Like, oh, we got a podcast. And I was like, slow down. These things take time. Huh. As, as someone that's built a business over 12 years, you really don't get excited because it's ultimately based on you to build up that audience. Right. You could have help, you could have assistance, you could have marketing and so forth, but you have to build up that audience week by week, upload by upload. And it may take a while, it may take years. This is, this is a long-term plan in terms of what we do, but I think it's finally time for us to do it. What's up y'all, it's Vlad from Vlad TV. Make sure you check out my full interview on No Jumper.